morning I'll be reading from Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man to the measure of faith. For we as having many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, and honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessities of the saints, giving them hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be at the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits, repay no, to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lie in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy is hungry, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves as we come to thee in prayer this morning. Thankful for this peaceful day that you bless us with, for the opportunity that we have to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ to study thy gospel, hear thy word preached, and sing songs to thy praise. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll find our, our worship acceptable and as we try to glorify you in everything that we do in life. We pray for the ones that, as I mentioned earlier, the ones that are sick, the ones that have lost loved ones. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be the ones preparing for the sick, that you would it be your will, Heavenly Father, to turn them to a normal walk of life. Pray for the ones that are caring for them. Pray for the ones again that have lost loved ones. That you comfort them and give them peace as long as you can. Heavenly Father, we pray for our country. We pray for the leaders of our country and all that love us. Heavenly Father, we pray that, for us, that we would be good citizens and good examples to others. Heavenly Father, help us be good examples as we reach out to each other. And help us to be good examples, to share your gospel and be effective, and to share your grace and mercy with others. All these blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing number 165 to help us to prepare our minds for the thank of the Lord's Supper. After we sing this song, the one who is appointed to preside over that. One six five.
regards to Jesus' everlasting uh, kingdom, we come around this table this morning to, to remember him, not just for the, the death that he, he gave upon the cross, but also that he is our king and he is the son of God and his, his reign will rule forever regardless of what man may think. Just a reminder, does everybody have a, a, an emblem? I've, I've got a couple of verses here and I'll, I'll read through these and, and uh, maybe they'll make sense. In Luke, the uh, first chapter, when Jesus uh, was announced for Mary, first chapter 32, 32 and 33, he will be great, well, I'll start with 31, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall, be ta and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest, Lord God, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there will be no end. But as he as he went to Jerusalem that last week, and as he approached the Jerusalem, we know he rode upon a, on a young colt donkey and the people were saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And it, this is in uh, Luke 19, uh, verse 38. It went on to read in 39. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd at the pig to rebuke your disciples. But he answered to them, I tell you that if these, if these shall keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. This past Wednesday, we, we talked about a lot of things in Ecclesiastes. One of the one of the things that came up, the topic was, what if, if you could know the future, would you want to know the future? If you could know the future, would you want to know the future? Jesus knew the future. He knew what was coming ahead. Not only did he know his, his death was imminent and it was necessary in order that I could be forgiven of sins, you could be forgiven of sins, that we could all, in the end, stand before God in judgment day and know <coughs> that we were right with him. And, and yet, as I was just thinking there in the, in the 19th chapter, he cried because if he approached Jerusalem, he knew what was going to happen to him. He cared deeply for Jerusalem, those his brethren, uh, his his countrymen, and he knew what was going to happen to him. He doesn't want us to be ignorant of what the things to come either. And so in Revelations, and I'll just read a couple of verses from, from Revelations, and then I'll say I don't completely understand Revelation from one end to the other. I don't know if anybody does here. Um, but John, but Jesus sent an angel to, to uh, come to John and give him, I'll say, encouragement. Give the encouragement to the churches there in Asia. Then the first chapter, starting with verse 4, John, and, and the angel said, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved you and washed you from your sins in his blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever behold he is coming with clouds and every hour I will see him even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him even so amen 
I think with that reading there, we know that he's coming back. And he's not just changed us of our sin, but he has made us kings and priests. That's just un, 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 I can't think of it that, that he would do such as that. But he wanted to encourage the churches there that were going through tribulation and, and hard times and things that there's so uncertainty. And I think about today, and and I guess every generation thinks of that, that they're going through the worst of all times. And, and when they think, well, just think about the good old days. Well, it's there's a good day coming for his children. And that's one thing that we need to remember each time we gather around this table. That Jesus is coming back. And he'll remember his children. And he has bled on the cross. He gave himself to die for that very thing that we might all stand with him and before him and say he is the great I am. Uh, at this time, uh, we partake of the bread as he is instructed at the uh, what we call the Last Supper. And as we take, uh, let's, let's give thanks for that, for this bread uh, at this time. Father, we thank you for your son, for the love that he had toward us and the, the honor that he has given you that he would die upon the cross, that he would give himself upon the cross, that he would die in our place. Father, be with us as we uh, partake of the bread for that represents his his body that he gave on the cross. We thank you for his great sacrifice for your love that you would extend him in our place. This we do in your son's name. Good morning. Again, it's great to see everybody this morning on a beautiful Lord's Day. And, uh, we've had plenty of rain this week, and now we feel like we're going to have plenty of sunshine 
uh, this coming week and some warmer temperatures. Uh, so I know the grass is going to love it, and hopefully the crops will too. Um, have you ever heard someone say, the grass is greener on the other side? You may have heard someone say, well, you learned that the grass wasn't greener on the other okay. side. Um, last week, um, another brother said, you know, um, it's better to see the grass than to see the roots. Things that people say about grass. And it's several, it's been, it's been a while back, but I was at a gas station paying for my gas and uh, being friendly with the lady and you could tell that she wasn't having such a, a great day. So I was just kind of, you know, asking her how she was and, and she said, well, we're seeing the better, we're seeing the greener side of the grass. <laughs> and I just thought for a moment, we're seeing the greener side of the grass. Not what she meant, I, I, I don't know where she, you know, I just knew that she wasn't in a, a very good mood. So I was just thinking, nah, I, don't, I don't know, but I thought, yeah, I thought about that. We're seeing the greener side of the grass. What if this life was it? The life that we know it, what if that was it? A life that sometimes is full of sorrow, sometimes is full of disappointment, sometimes that is, you know, there's, it's, we have had to deal with COVID issues, we've had the, the political divide in this country, and, and death that comes to our loved ones, and what if that was it? No hope of a better future. And, you know, as we think about that, that we think that this life, as we know it, is it's as good as it gets. This is it. You know, I think about what Paul said, and, and Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, he said, in this life, if in this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Another version put it this way, if we have had hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. And the last version that I want to share there says, if our hope in Christ is only for this life here on earth, then people should feel more sorry for us than anyone else. Is there more than this life? Is there more than this, the greener side of the grass that we may be seeing right now? You know, as we think about that, we think about what we, what we have and what he's given us. He's given us life, hasn't he? We all need to realize in this life there's birth and in this life there's also death. You see that in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. When he said to everything, there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. You see, God provided us with life. He provided us with life. We go back to the beginning, and, and what did he do? He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the, er and over all the earth, and over all, every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So what did God do? He created a man in his own image, the image of man and the image of God created him. And who did he create? He created male, and he created female. And he saw that it was good. He saw that his creation, he saw that it was very good. But yet, what did man do? Man brought death. Man brought sin into the world by, by, by falling into the temptation of Satan. And in, in Genesis 3, 19, In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread, till thou return into the ground. For out of it was thou taken, and from dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. Are we seen the greener side of the grass? Or is the grass greener on the other side? That's the question I want to pose to us this morning. You see, because we have a promise of life. We can read in Romans chapter 5, 17 through 19, when he says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more are they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment come upon all men to condemnation, even so by righteousness of one, the free gift came unto, upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. We see in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, we see, for he says, For since by man came death, by, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. 
For as in Adam, what do all men do? They all die, but even in Christ, what happens? We're all made alive. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14, but he says, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. But you sorrow not, he says, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died, if we believe that he died and that he rose again, even so them which are asleep in, in Jesus, what will God do? He will bring with him the promise of life that we have. We see that again the promise in First in First Peter chapter one, which is three three five. He says, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy, mercy has begotten us again unto what? To a lively hope, a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Listen to what we have. What kind of hope do we have? To an inheritance that is incorruptible. To an inheritance that is undefiled." To an inheritance that will not fade away. To an inheritance that's where? That's reserved in heaven for you. He says, who are kept by the power of God through faith in the salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Is the grass greener? When we read those scriptures, we know that the grass is definitely greener on the other side. Yet there are so many. There are so many who will deny that there is life after death. But we know that's nothing new. We know that's nothing new. When we turn to Mark chapter 12, we can see that we can see there in Mark 12 that the, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They questioned Jesus even about a woman who was married to, to, to seven brothers and wanted to know whose wife the woman was going to be in the resurrection. Jesus let them know real quickly, though, that they were erring. We see then that, that when they talked about the resurrection of the dead in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, it says, As they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people. The Sadducees were grieved that they were teaching the people about the resurrection of the dead. And they preached to them, and it says, and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They didn't want to hear that. Sadducees. Sad to see. The greener side of the grass, where is it? We see then, and in Acts 23, verses 6 through 8, we see that Paul perceives that one of the groups are Sadducees, and one of the groups are Pharisees. And so he, he causes a little dissension there. And he cries out to the council and says, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of the Pharisee, and of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. And look what happens in verse 7. And when he had said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the, Pharisees, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then you had individuals who didn't believe in the resurrection. Today we have people that don't believe in the resurrection. They think that this is as good as it gets. Some were mocked for teaching about it. We know that, we remember Paul on Mars Hill when he expanded to them about Jesus after reading the inscription to the unknown God in Acts 17. In Acts 17, to the unknown God whom you, wor you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. He preached to them right there about God. He preached to them about, about Jesus. And he said in verse 30, the times of this ignorance, what did God do? The times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to do what? He commands them to repent. Why? Why does he do that? We read in verse 31, because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he, he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and then others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. See, we have individuals that are going to mock. We may have individuals that even as we, we, we uh, televise and we, we send our, our message on Facebook Live that may be saying, he is a crazy guy up there talking about the resurrection of the dead. You're going to go right back to the ground and that's where you're going to stay. Where is the promise of his coming? That was a question they asked in 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we see it starting in verse 1 when he says, This second epistle believed I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. I'm going to stir you up. 
I want to stir you up with this. He says that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the Holy Prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. What was he going to say? Knowing this first in verse 3. That there shall come in the last day scoffers walking with their own lust. There's going to be individuals that are going to be saying, this is not, this is not true. You're making this up. What are they going to be asking? They're going to be asking, where is the promise of his coming? In verse 9, where is the promise of his coming? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness. But it's long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why is he long suffering with us? Because in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. He's, when he comes, it's, it's going to be unexpected. He says, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. In verse 11, he says, Seeing then that the, all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons? What manner of persons ought ye to be in our holy conversation and godliness? Where is the promise of his coming? He's not slack concerning that promise. He is long suffering to us. Why? Because there's a day that's coming. There's a day that's going to be coming, and he wants us to be what? He wants us to be prepared. He says in verse 12, looking forward and hastening into the coming of the day of God, where the heavens shall be being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. When we think about that, it puts it in perspective, is the grass greener on the other side? Is, is this earth, is this it? Is this the things that we enjoy? And he's given us many things on here to, to, in this earth to enjoy. But is this it? We think about what happens when we die. And, and I had a cousin that as, as he was, he knew, he knew death was, 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 was sooner than later. And he and his wife were kind of just making, making light of it. Because sometimes in, in that situation, you can but he said, and she was saying some things that she was going to do, you know, and, and he said, I'm going to come back and haunt you. You know, and just thinking about that, and then so we had the conversation, well, do, do you come back? Or what? He said, look what happens when you die. And, and we know when we look at it, and of course they were just kind of being a little bit silly, but we know that when the body, what does it do? When the body dies, we see in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. If this is all we have is the body, then that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to go back to the earth. But look what he says. And the spirit, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. This old body that I have, this, this earthly vessel that I have, will one day be no more. But the spirit is going to go back to God. In what condition? Will it go back to God? When he has it, is he going to know that spirit? Or is he going to say, I don't know that spirit? We see the spirit, and as we talk about the spirit here in, in Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 16, we see then the rich man and the Lazarus. And let's read through that, starting in verse 19 of Luke chapter 16. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. He saw some green side of the grass, didn't he? And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid on at, at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Did he see the green side of the grass while he was living? And it came, to, it came to pass, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the, the rich man also died and, and he was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Being in torments and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Here, the individual who had lived life to its fullest, who had whatever he wanted, but forgotten the most important thing. 
had forgotten to take care of his soul. Here he is in, he is in torment. And he wants out of torment. He just wants a just a dip of water and then somebody's finger just a drop to go be on his tongue to cool it off. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou that in your lifetime you received the good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things? Now he's comforted, and you're tormented. And besides all this, betwixt you and us is a great gulf fixed, so that they which pass from hence to you cannot. Neither, he says, can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he's like, well, if they can't come to me, what, what? He says, I pray the Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. I have five brethren, and if, if you can't help me, you can't cool me down, send them back, send somebody back to, to talk to my brothers. He says there, and he says, that they may testify unto them, lest they should also come into this place of torment. It was so bad, he did not want anyone else to be there. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, nay, Father Abraham, but if, if one went from the dead, they, they would repent. They would see it. Somebody come back from the dead, it's gonna, they, they'll change their mind. But not, they just can't hear it. They've got to they see that. He said, and they said to them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Is the grass Greener. Is the grass greener on the other side? Are we seeing the best side of the grass? We know that what it happens. The spirit, what does it do? It lives on. The spirit moves on. And we have to, and how we give it back to God, that's our choice. How we live this life, that's our choice. But we see the beauty of those who are going to see the greener side of the grass, those who are Christian, because we see then, as we look in Luke chapter 20, 23, as awful as it was, as they were, as Jesus was up on the cross, and you had one, and, and we know that the, Jesus was there because of what man done. But we know that the thieves were there because of what they had done. And it says, and the, the, one of the thieves said, we, in verse 41, he says, We indeed justly will receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. He said unto Jesus, Lord, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy, thy kingdom. And Jesus said, I verily I say unto you, today shalt thou shall be with me into paradise. That's what you and I want Jesus to do for us. We want him to remember us when we go into the kingdom. We want him to know us when we go into the kingdom. In Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 32, the Spirit, what did Jesus' the Spirit do? Did it stay in the grave? As we look there, and we look at verse, starting in verse 22, he says, You men of Israel, you hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves know. Him being delivered by the determined uh, counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands you crucified, you slain him, whom God did what? Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding the bit. Jesus, our Savior, he died like you and I will die one day. But he arose from the dead because the death could not keep him. In verse, uh, verse 31, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus, this Jesus who we talk about, the gospel that we share, the good news, this is it. This Jesus God hath raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. We think about that, and we think about the, the Spirit moving on, and, and we think about the judgment day, and what's going to happen then? What's going to happen on, that, on, that, on the judgment day? We see then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, and starting in verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. What's that mystery? That we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. How are we going to be changed? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal shall put on immortality. 
So when this corruption was put on incorruption, this mortal was put on immortality, death should be uh, brought, brought to pass. The same that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. We can see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as we read that, what did it do? What happened here? It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ. What's going to happen? The dead in Christ are going to rise up first. In verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Think about that. For some, that's going to be a great day. And we sing that song, there's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by, when the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to come? For some individuals, that judgment day, it's going to be a bright day. It's going to be a bright day, but this brightness shall only come to them that love the Lord. And for some, it's going to be a sad day. A sad day. When the sinner shall hear his doom, depart, I know you not. Are you ready for that day to come? He says, are you ready for the judgment day? Are you and I ready for the judgment day? Are we ready? Are we ready? That, do we know that after, as the point of the man wants to die, but after this, the judgment in, in Hebrews 9, verse 27. We know that from Matthew chapter 24, verses 35 through 36, we know that the heaven and earth, we know it's going to pass away. We know that the words of God, that they're not going to pass away. He says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but who? God only knows that day. We know that from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, we know there is no escape of the judgment. Nobody's going to escape it. But at the times and the seasons, brethren, you, we, you have no need that I write unto you. To, to you. But your, he says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety, and then suddenly destruction comes upon them, as a travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. No one will escape the judgment of God. We know, in conclusion, we can ask that question. Will the grass be greener on the other side? Will the grass be greener on the other side for you? Will the grass be greener on the other side for me? When I read in Romans chapter 14, starting in verse 10, he says, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I, as I live, says the Lord, Every knee, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Every one of us will give an account to God. In Matthew 12, verse 36, but he says, but I say to you that every idle word, imagine every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account of their when on the day of judgment. We can read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 20, 27, when he says, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward Every man according to his works makes me think and makes me realize the importance of my soul, the importance of how I live my life here on this earth. You see, because the rest is for those who come to Jesus. The rest is for those who put on Jesus. The rest is for those who live for Jesus. The rest is for those who die in Jesus. That's why he said, You come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And he said, I will give you rest. Rest for those who crucified the old man. Rest for those who put that life of sin away. Rest for those who put on Jesus Christ through baptism. Those who live their life with Christ so that you can walk, so that you can walk in the greener grass. Brother Charlie Christopher, in conclusion, used to say, he would stand up before the congregation and he'd say, if you miss heaven, then your life has been a complete failure. 
We can be as a rich man and we can have a sumptuous life here on this earth. We can enjoy it, we can enjoy it, but if we miss heaven, we miss the entire thing. This morning, don't hinder, don't, don't let, don't let the, the joys of this world hinder you from experiencing the joys of heaven. If you, if there is a confession that needs to be made, do so this morning. If you want to, if you haven't been baptized and put on Christ, do that this morning as we stand and sing the invitation song. Christ, your brother. 